But well, today as we continue in our time of worship, I want to read out of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 13. The Bible says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And what a powerful reminder it is for all of us as we walk through this life we keep our eyes focused on the grace that will come when Jesus Christ appears. Well, this morning we want to uh, lift praises to the Lord through prayer and certainly want to give our our burdens and requests over to Him. And this morning we want to uh, pray for Miss Sherry Bell and her family. Her father passed away on Friday night, and uh, it's a bittersweet thing. It's a it's sweet knowing that he's in the arm of Jesus now. He's in his eternal home. But, Sherry, just know that we're praying for you during this uh, difficult time. So, uh, And then others, perhaps you're carrying a burden this morning, and uh, now is the time that we go to the Lord. So I'm going to invite you to stand. Let's stand and let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we, we do thank you for the song, the message that the children just gave us, Lord. We have so many things to uh, lift, uh, reasons to lift praises to your name, Lord. You're so good to us, and we thank you for your abundant mercy and grace. And Lord, just as your word reminded us, Father, may our our focus and our minds uh, be stayed on the wonderful truth that you are coming back, and we long for that day, Lord. We know that as believers, we're not exempt from trials and tribulations. We're not exempt from hardship, but Lord, we know this for sure. No matter what you allow us to face, you are always there with us. You travel the difficult roads with us, and we thank you for that. Nothing can separate us from your amazing love. And Lord, today I just want to lift up Sherry and her family to you as they mourn their loss. Lord, I thank you that Mr. Cloud had that time in his life where he surrendered his life over to you. Lord, you tell us in your word that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And, Father, because of his faith, we know that he is with you now. And, Lord, for others who've lost loved ones, we take assurance in knowing that, that you overcame sin and death for us. You overcame the grave so that uh, when we face death and when our loved ones face death, Lord, we don't, we don't mourn as those who have no hope. And so, Lord, I, I pray for others today who are struggling with just different burdens, different hardships. Lord, we lay them at your feet. Lord, we praise you for who you are. You're an awesome God. We thank you for your love and your mercy and grace. And we thank you mostly for Jesus Christ. We thank you that while we were yet sinners, you loved us and you came and you died for us. You gave your life for us. And we celebrate today knowing that you're alive. And so, Lord, today we we do come wanting to celebrate the name of Jesus. We celebrate the resurrection today and the hope that we have knowing that you are alive. And so, Father, we pray that, that through everything that happens in this service, we pray that you would be glorified. We ask that you would watch over us throughout this service, protect us from the enemy as we know that we're in a battle and he wants to distract us from your great name. And so, Father, I, I pray, Lord, that if there's anybody in our midst today who has never come to that place of repentance, they've never accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. Lord, I pray for those who are not able to be here with us. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you would uh, be with them. For those who are traveling, give them traveling mercies. Lord, we give this whole service over to you. We love you, we praise you, and we ask these things in Christ's name and all God's people said, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to uh, welcome everybody today to our time of worship, time of celebration for all of our guests. It's truly an honor to have you with us. It's always good to have guests with us as we uh, worship together and worship the great name of Jesus Christ. Be sure that you fill out the who's who in the pew, and that way we'll have a record of your attendance. Brother Mark, if you'll come and continue to lead us in worship. Salvation 
Son, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. Perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior, all the day long this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long god sent his son they called him he came to love, heal and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives how sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives but greater still the come assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives because he lives I can face Because he lives, 
and then one day I'll cross the river I'll fight life's final war with pain and then as death gives way to victory I'll see the light of glory and I'll know he lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know And life is worth the living just because he
choir. He is the cornerstone. We celebrate his great name today. Well, today we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, we're going to be in verses 28 through 44 today. If you will be making your way to Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 44. As you're turning there, I want to mention you may have noticed in our bulletin that uh, we're starting something um, new here at First Baptist. We're starting to have a uh, deacon of, of the week. And as you can uh, see, if you already haven't noticed, that's, uh, Mr. Ron Baxley is our deacon of the week. And that is just for you as a church family. If, um, if, there, if there's a need that arises during the week, if you need somebody to pray with, uh, you need uh, something that you just need minister, ministering to, um, their contact information is there, so you can certainly contact the church office, contact the staff, but also contact the, um, the deacon of the week. And normally, and I, and I take responsibility of this, uh, the deacon of the week will also come and uh, pray at our offertory uh, time. And I told everybody, except for Brother Mark, that uh, Brother Ron is going to come and pray. So, Brother Ron, I do apologize. Where is Brother Ron? Okay. <laughs> Uh, he, he got mad and left. <laughs> uh, but if he is back, uh, he will come and conclude our service uh, in prayer. So uh, just want to thank our deacons and pray for our deacons as they seek to fulfill the ministry that God has uh, called them to because they have a very important uh, ministry. All right, Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 44, if you will stand as we honor the reading of God's Word this morning, Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 28, as we talk about the king riding on a donkey, the king riding on a donkey. The Bible says, and when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village in front of you where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you are untying it, you shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down to the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Well, let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. We pray, Father, that you would use the truth that is in your word to speak to our hearts. Father, I pray that you would soften our hearts so that we can receive the truth that you have for us today. Lord, we know that you don't want us just to acquire knowledge for the sake of knowledge, but you give us your word in order to bring about change in our lives. And Lord, we do want to change. We want to become more like our Savior. And so, Father, we just ask that you would be honored during this time of teaching, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As you know, on Tuesday, we are going to have what we call the Georgia primaries, where we will be voting on those candidates that we would like to see run for president. And 
I'll just say that this, I cannot underestimate this enough. Well, I certainly will not stand here and tell you who to vote for. That is not my responsibility. I will say this, number one, be sure that you go and vote. That is one of the privileges, the great privileges of living in a democracy. And one of the freedoms that we have as God's people is, is that we can choose our leaders. So be sure on Tuesday you go and vote. But when you go and vote, be sure that you go with your Bible in your mind, not, maybe not in your hand. But go into that voting booth with your Bible. Vote with biblical convictions. Use a biblical worldview as you vote. So I say all that as certainly as a way to remind us of our need to vote, but also as an introduction to today's passage because we know that we will soon be electing a new president. And in January, there will be what we call an inauguration where that new president will be inaugurated and will take the office. And as you know, Presidents, when they are inaugurated into office, there is quite a celebration. And it's a, it's a celebration that, um, that, that goes on for, for quite a, a while. And today we see a coronation of a king. I would say not a king, the king. This is Jesus Christ. Of course, this passage is familiar to many of us. We're entering into the Easter season. It's hard to believe that uh, we will soon be in the, much, uh, in the month of March. And Easter comes early this year, so we will soon be celebrating what we call Palm Sunday, which is what uh, is happening here. The triumphal entry would happen on Palm Sunday. And on this special day, Jesus Christ comes into Jerusalem. Uh, for for uh, roughly three and a half years, we've been studying uh, or we haven't been studying for three and a half years. seems like three and a half years we've been in the book of Luke. Uh, but uh, for three and a half years, Jesus spent uh, his time on earth in official ministry. We, we, we know that estimates tell us that he was about 30, 32, 33 years old when he died. But his official public ministry lasted about three and a half years. And he went through Galilee. He was healing. He was preaching. He was preaching that the kingdom of God had come. But he knew his final destination was Jerusalem. And it was in Jerusalem that he would give his life as a ransom for many. Mark chapter 10, verse 45, the key verse for Mark, tells us that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so finally, this is the climax of Jesus' ministry. He is, he is coming finally to Jerusalem where he will give his life on the cross, but then, praise God, on the third day would rise from the grave. But as he comes to Jerusalem, he comes in what we call the triumphal entry, where he comes riding in on a donkey. Thus, the title, the king riding on a donkey. Certainly, when you think of a coronation, you don't typically envision a king riding in on a donkey. Uh, that's certainly not the... The, the picture that we have in mind, we have in mind of something much more grandiose, not something so humble as this. But this speaks of the humility of Christ. His whole life spoke of His humility, the fact that the very Son of God, the one who created everything, was willing to leave the glories of heaven where He was worshipped by angels. He came to live amongst sinful people in order to give His life for us. And so here is the King, and certainly... Jesus is the true king. And we know that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is truly the king of kings and lord of lords. And so today we're talking about the triumphal entry. And as we look at this text today, I've divided it up into four different divisions. Four things that I want us to take note of as we look in this, uh, this story, this factual account, this event that happened in the life of of Jesus, the triumphal entry. The first thing that I want to point out in verses 28 through 36, I want us to look at the triumphal entry's total cooperation. We see that there was total cooperation on that day. You'll notice again, verse 28, it says, And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage in Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples. And so we see in this, on this special day, this day of the triumphal entry, I say that there was total cooperation because we see specifically 
three different people or groups of people who, who were totally cooperative with Jesus' plan. And by the way, Jesus knew about this day long before the day happened. Uh, he's a sovereign God. He's an all-knowing God. And this day, as he comes riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, this was fulfillment of Scripture. And by the way, this is recorded in all three of the Gospels. Matthew, or excuse me, all four of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all record the triumphal entry. And so what we see playing out before us is all fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Now Matthew records that on this day that there were actually two donkeys. There was the mother and then the, the fowl the, the, or the, the colt um, of the, uh, the, the, the little, the child donkey. Let's just say that, the child donkey. But that's in fulfillment of scripture. Zechariah 9 chapter 9 or chapter 9 verse 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you righteous and having salvation. Is he humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey? Now that was some 500 years before this event, but yet we see uh, before us prophecy being perfectly Fulfilled. So I say that there was total cooperation, first of all, from the disciples. So the text says that Jesus pulls two of his disciples to the side. In verse 30, he says, Go into the village in front of you where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. And then verse 31, If anyone asks you why are you untying it, you shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away. So they totally cooperate with Jesus' plan. They do exactly what Jesus told them to do. Now, as I said, in Matthew's account of this, he says that there is two donkeys. Luke here focuses just on the baby donkey, the child donkey, if you will. And the reason why it is the, the child donkey, the, the, the cult, is because in the Old Testament, uh, something of this occasion... The only type of animal you would use would be an animal that had not been used for any common sort of uh, use, purpose. And so thus you have this young colt who is used. So the disciples are completely obedient. They cooperate with Jesus' plan. But not only the disciples, but also the owners of the donkey. I, I, I love this. It says the disciples, they go and uh, they do just as Jesus uh, told them to do. And this is almost kind of humorous because it says that they went away and they found it just as he had told them. And then it says, and as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? Now, that's kind of funny because I'm just envisioning this happening. Uh, can you imagine you go out to your car and someone's trying to hotwire your car? Well, this is kind of what's going on here. So they're like, hey, what are you doing with my donkey or, or with my donkey's? You're taking my donkeys. And you notice they, they say this, just a simple phrase, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, throwing their cloaks on the colt. And they sat Jesus on it. So the disciples were, were cooperative. The, the owners of the donkeys, they, they, they simply um, recognized the authority. Certainly they had heard of Jesus. By this point, Jesus would have been very well known. And uh, perhaps these owners, uh, in their minds, recognize that Jesus was the Messiah as well. So they, they allow the disciples to take the donkey. They put their clothes on the back of the donkey, like a saddle. And they sat Jesus on it. And there's a third, third, not a person, but a third something that is cooperative with Jesus. Who is that, or what is that, that cooperates here with Jesus? the donkey. Now I think this is fascinating because this is a colt. This is a this is a untrained donkey, one that had not been ridden. But yet Jesus sits on this donkey and the donkey calmly rides with Jesus on its back. That's just absolutely amazing. And and from all this, from this cooperation, we learn some things about Jesus. We learn about his authority, that he has all authority. We learn about his omniscience. Jesus knew exactly where the donkey would be at. He knew exactly what would happen. Some people say, well, you know, he had this prearranged. I don't think this was prearranged. 
Why do we have to try to explain this? Jesus was not only man, but he was God. He knew exactly where the donkey would be tied. He knew exactly the reaction of the donkey's owner. He knew it all because he's all-knowing. He knows everything about us. He knows everything about the world and what is going on. But not only do we learn about his authority and his omniscience, but we learn about his power. Again, this goes back to this cult. He's able to ride on this young donkey's back. And you know, as I was thinking about that, I thought about this truth, that Jesus Christ can tame the untamable. He can tame the untamable. And perhaps today you come with something in your life that just seems like it's untamable. And from an earthly perspective, perspective there's nothing that can tame it but there is one who can tame it and that is Jesus Christ because he is all-knowing he is all-powerful so we see the triumphal entries total cooperation number two second major division comes in verse 37 through 38 we see the triumphal entries temporal celebration so we see total cooperation then we see the temporal celebration so here comes Jesus again they place the blanket's on the donkey's back, serving as a saddle. Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem. And when he comes riding into Jerusalem, um, they're putting things, they're laying their, their garments on the ground. The Gospel of John says that they laid palm branches on the ground. All this was symbolic of the people's submission to Jesus. They, they had recognized that this was the promised Messiah. And so here is this great celebration. Now, there would have been a lot of people there on, on this day because this is the week of the Passover. So many people had come to celebrate the Passover. And here they are celebrating the Passover lamb. And so there's just great celebration. And, and don't, don't confuse this when it talks about the disciples. It's not like this was just the 12 disciples that were, that were celebrating. Bible scholar, scholars estimate that perhaps there were thousands of people there that day singing out praises to the Messiah, singing out Hosanna to, uh, to, to God in the highest. They're, they're declaring that he is the Messiah. So there is this temporal celebration. Now the reason why I say it's a temporal celebration because this crowd is a fickle crowd. Crowd. Because right here at the beginning of the week, we see that they are, they are singing praises to Jesus. Hosanna, which means save now. But just in a few days later, this very same crowd, many of these same people who were, who were crying out Hosanna would be crying out crucify him. Now why? Why such a change in the attitude? Well, you see, the people there... They had a, an invention in their mind of what the Messiah was to be. In their minds, Jesus was the Messiah, the one who was coming to Jerusalem not to die on the cross. But Jesus would be the one to bring death to the Romans. So in their mind, they're thinking that Jesus had finally come to Jerusalem. And he would perform more miracles demonstrating his power. And he would finally overthrow the Roman oppression and rule, and Jesus would bring peace. But then during that week, when Jesus didn't live up to their expectations, and he wasn't the Messiah that they had invented in their minds, they rejected him, and they called out for his blood. So we see here this temporal celebration. Number three. Not only do we see the total cooperation, we see the temporal celebration, but then in verses 39 through 40, we see this tense confrontation. You'll notice there in verse 39, And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. So not everybody that day was celebrating. There was, what I preached on a couple weeks ago, there was a cold water committee, right? That was the Pharisees. They hear all these people praising Jesus. They're celebrating their Messiah, and they're not happy. Now, it says some of the Pharisees, and let's just be, let's just be careful. There were some Pharisees who actually submitted to Christ as Lord and received Him as Messiah. But most of the Pharisees rejected Him. Most of them 
craved. They loved the power and the authority they had over the people. And so when they hear all this celebration and they hear these people giving adoration to Jesus and Jesus allowing them to give him adoration, they are really upset because they're, really they're afraid. They're afraid because their, their fear was is that Jesus would come to Jerusalem and lead a revolt against the Romans. The Romans would come and crush it, and along with that would also uh, do away with their power and their authority. So they cry out to Jesus and they say, Look, you need to tell your disciples, you need to tell your followers to be quiet. And I love what Jesus says there in verse 40 when he says, I tell you, if these were silent, talking about those who were singing praises to his name, he says, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Jesus is saying that praise to my name will not be stopped. It makes me think of, of what Jesus said about even the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. There is nothing that can stop his name from being glorified. His name will be celebrated. His name will be exalted. And if you read the last chapter in the book of Revelation, you see that His name will be praised. His name will be glorified. So we see this tense confrontation. And then we close in verses 41 through 44 with this terrible condemnation. There is this terrible condemnation. Now I want, to, I want you to notice... This is amazing. As Jesus comes into Jerusalem, the people are shouting and praising His name. They're singing Hosanna, crying out praises to their Messiah. But Notice verse 41. It says, And when He drew near and saw the city, He wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. You see, Jesus, he saw through the praises. He saw that it was artificial because he recognized that these people were not praising him according to truth. Again, they saw him as the Messiah who would deliver them from the Roman oppression. They saw him as a political Messiah, not a spiritual Messiah. And most of the people in Israel rejected Jesus Christ. The Bible says that he came to his own, but his own received him not. And so as he comes into Jerusalem, Jesus is weeping. In the original Greek, that word weeping has the idea of sobbing. Jesus is sobbing with compassion over the people because he sees the hardness of their hearts. He sees that they had rejected the truth, the revelation that they had been given. That He saw that they had, they had the opportunity to repent and to receive true peace, true lasting peace, but for the most, they rejected him. And so he weeps with compassion over the people. But then he, de he declares this terrible condemnation. He says there in verse 43, For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear down to the ground you and your children within you and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. So Jesus is speaking of judgment here. He's giving prophecy. He's saying, Because you have rejected me as the true Messiah, not the Messiah of your imagination. You haven't surrendered to me in repentance. There's coming a day that you will be judged. And this all was fulfilled perfectly in A.D. 70 when the Jewish people led a revolt against the Romans and the Romans came and they squashed that uh, rebellion. They tore down the walls of Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple and over 600,000 Jews were slaughtered by the Romans. So that is why I say it was a terrible condemnation. So two words of application as we, as we study this triumphal entry. You know, this is one of these texts that if you were raised in church, you say, yeah, I know about this. We, we, we talk about this on Palm Sunday. If we're not careful, you can meet, uh, miss the application. And what is the application? I believe the application is, is really comes in the way of a challenge. And the first challenge is this, we must have a proper view of Jesus. We must have a proper view of Jesus. Again, there were many on that day that were, were crying out, Hosanna, which means save now. 
But, but the problem was is they had a Messiah that they had invented in their mind. It wasn't according to truth. Again, they, they weren't looking for a spiritual Messiah. They were looking for a political Messiah. And when Jesus did not live up to their expectations, they rejected Him and called for His crucifixion. And if we're not careful, we too can have a Jesus that we have invented in our minds. And what I mean by that is we say, you know what? Hey, I want Jesus. Jesus is going to fix all my problems. He's going to make life lovely. He's going to make my wallet full of money. He's going to make me wealthy and healthy and everything will be great. And then when Jesus doesn't do that, when he doesn't live up to our expectation, we reject him. So we must, must make sure that we have a proper view of Jesus. And that view can only come from sacred scriptures, that he is the Messiah. He is not one to come to make this earthly life perfect. He tells us that we will, through many tribulations, enter into the kingdom. But he is faithful. And only those who are faithful to him, whose faith endures, will be saved. So we must have a proper view of Jesus. But then from this, as I was thinking about this yesterday afternoon, as I was just reading this text and I and, uh, was reading with some other... Um, commentators said about this I, I think that we also should have a proper view of people because here's Jesus and he knows that the majority of those who were singing praises to his name in just a few short days would be crying out crucify him but you'll notice what is his reaction towards those people he weeps for them he has compassion for them and none of, here's here's the thing church None of those people deserved his compassion and mercy, but he still loved them, and he still wept for them. And you know what? As God's people, and maybe I can only speak for myself, but it's easy, it's easy to extend mercy to those who we think deserve it. But how about that person that comes up to you, you see them on the side of the road, they're holding up the sign, work for food, and we say, oh, you know, they're just scamming. They don't deserve it. They've got themselves into this situation. We must view people through the lenses of Jesus Christ. We too must have compassion on those who don't deserve mercy, on those who don't deserve His grace. Because the last time I checked, there's not a single one of us seated here today who deserved His mercy and His grace. But praise God that He loved us still. Well, let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we, we pray that as we, as we learn more today from your word, that we won't fall for the trap that many in Jesus fell for. They, they invented a Messiah of their own making. They invented a Messiah according to their own terms. Lord, may we receive you according to truth, and may we follow you obediently as followers of Jesus Christ. And even when... Life is difficult. Even when we go through things that we, that we don't understand and in our flesh we don't think that we deserve, Lord, may we still faithfully follow you because, Lord, you are deserving of our faithfulness to you. Lord, we thank you that you were faithful all the way to the cross. You gave your life for us. And we thank you that you aren't just a political Messiah, but you are a spiritual Messiah. And one day you will come back. And every political ruler in this world will acknowledge that you are the true Messiah. But Lord, until that day is your people. Lord, may also we be like you in that we view people with the eyes of Jesus. Lord, we encounter people every day that are in much need of mercy. Lord, may we not have the attitude that we only extend mercy to those whom we think deserve it. But Lord, may we love people and may we weep over people just as you did. People, sinners, who need your mercy and grace. So, Lord, we pray that as we come to this time of invitation, Father, we pray that we would come with humility. We're reminded here of Jesus. He came with humility, riding in on a donkey. Lord, may we have that same humility. And maybe there's something that we need to come to the altar about, and we need to lay at your feet in humility. Lord, maybe there's somebody here today, and in humility they need to acknowledge that that. They need a Savior. They need to be saved. Lord, I pray for those who are, who are hurting today, those who know of people who are hurting. Lord, I pray for those who, are, who, who have wavered in their faith. They're not where they need to be in their walk with you. Lord, we pray for them. 
We pray that you would work in their hearts today and draw them back to yourself. Lord, we pray that above everything that you would be glorified in our time of invitation, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, at this time, I'm going to invite you to stand as we have a hymn of response this morning. Hymn number 513, The Nail-Scarred Hand. The altars are open if you want to come to the altars and pray. The altars will be open if there's a decision you need to make. Don't procrastinate. Don't put it off. Come and do whatever Jesus is leading you to do as we sing hymn number 513. Have you failed in your plan? Have you storm tossed life? Place your hand in the nail scarred hand. Are you weary and worn from its toil and strife? Place your hand in the nail scarred hand. Place your hand. Place your hand. 